Hi, I'm Trevor Stanley, and this work studies which tasks should be learned together in multitask learning. In multitask learning, multiple predictions need to be made for a given input. The goal of multitask learning is usually to achieve one or more of the following benefits. Decreased training time, decreased inference time, more compact models, increased prediction accuracy for one or more tasks, increased sample efficiency, or better learned representations. Often, an improvement in one objective can be traded for an improvement in others. Our setup uses an encoder-decoder architecture. Single task networks have a single decoder for the one task that they solve. Multitask networks have a single encoder and multiple decoders, one for each task that they solve. Unfortunately, multitask learning doesn't always perform well. Often, training each task with a separate network works the best. This is true even if the multitask network is much larger than the independent networks. This could be because the tasks must be learned at different rates, or because one task dominates the learning, producing poor performance in the other tasks. Also, gradients from each task sometimes interfere. Furthermore, the optimization landscape of multiple summed losses can be more difficult to optimize. And intuitively, the relationship between learned tasks is one of the factors that determines how well multitask learning performs. There is extensive existing literature on multitask learning. Since our work analyzes task relationships, we are similar to Taskonomy, which does so for transfer learning. A 2017 work analyzes task relationships for natural language processing. Cross-task consistency studies how making multiple task predictions consistent can improve the learning. Many works attempt to minimize negative transfer by carefully balancing the scale of each task's loss. One such work computes task weights that align network gradients. Another uses uncertainty to compute task weights. GradNorm attempts to balance the influence of each task on network gradients. Lastly, two comparisons of task weighting strategies find no clear winner. They find that unit task weights often come out on top, which is what we observe. Finally, many works attempt to overcome negative transfer using architectural approaches. We provide an empirical study of a number of factors that influence multitask learning, such as network size, data set size, and most importantly, the influence tasks have on one another when learned together. Furthermore, we design an empirical task grouping framework for choosing which tasks to learn together and which tasks to learn separately to achieve the highest prediction accuracy with multiple neural networks subject to an inference time budget. Having a fixed amount of time allotted for inference is common in robotics tasks, such as autonomous driving. Most data sets for multitask learning are small, having fewer than 200,000 instances and fewer than four tasks. Furthermore, those tasks are often artificial. We found that the multitask learning trends on such data sets were unrepresentative. Instead, we use the, the Taskonomy data set. This data set is large, four and a half million instances. Each instance is labeled for a diverse set of 26 tasks, including 2D, 3D, and semantic tasks. From the Taskonomy data set, we have selected two sets of five tasks each. Task set one includes semantic segmentation, depth estimation, surface normals, key points, and edges. Task set two includes autoencoder, surface normals again, occlusion edges, reshading, and principal curvature. We run experiments under four different settings. We test the effect of network size on multitask learning with setting one. It uses smaller and, less, and, and a less deep network than the other settings. Setting two is the control. It has a large network, the full data set, and task set one. We test the effect of data set size on multitask learning with setting three. Here we limit ourselves to only 200,000 instances. Finally, we test more task relationships with setting four, which uses task set two. We exhaustively train a network for all two to the n minus one subsets of the five tasks in each of the four settings. In part one, we will show how Task, uh, we will study how tasks interact in multitask learning. In our first setting, five choose two of the networks are two task networks, five choose three are three task networks, five choose four are four task networks, and there is a single five task network, five choose five. This graph shows the average relative performance of these multitask networks compared to independent training. 
Note that the top of the y-axis is zero. We see that independent networks tend to be superior, but this comparison is a bit unfair. Single multi a single multitask network is being compared against several single task networks, which each take the same time to compute. Decoders are lightweight, so by varying the number of channels in each layer of the encoder, we can train a smaller or larger capacity network. When our independent networks use smaller encoders, such that total inference time is the same for independent networks and multitask networks, multitask net uh, learning can come out ahead on average. We have the best bang for the buck when we have an intermediate number of tasks in each network. This presents an opportunity for multiple tasks for multitask networks to outperform one large multitask network. On average, however, two task networks still experience negative transfer. Here are those two task networks and their performances compared to two half-size independent networks. For example, this is the performance of semantic segmentation when it's trained with normals compared to when it's trained by itself. Most two task networks perform badly and on average, single task networks perform more than 1% better However, we can see that adding surface normal prediction helps the performance of every task it is trained with. And semantic segmentation sees a benefit when it is trained with anything else. By taking the average of that matrix and its transpose, we can get a measure of task affinity. We can compare this with the task affinity published in Tasconomy for transfer learning. We would expect to see a strong positive correlation between these two, but we don't see that in this data. This means that transfer learning relationships are not a good indicator of multitask relationships. To test the effect of network capacity, the previous networks were trained on a cut down encoder. We train another set of 31 networks on the higher capacity encoder for our second setting. We see that the relationships between tasks are considerably different and that networks with two tasks tend to compare more favorably to half size single task networks with this higher capacity architecture. Yet, there are still pairs of tasks such as depth and key points that both perform worse when trained together than when trained apart. Again, we don't find a positive correlation between these multitask affinities and transfer learning task affinities. In the next setting, we try the same full-sized high capacity network as in the last setting, but we limit our training data to 200,000 instances. This is 20 times less data and is more similar to the size of other multitask data sets out there we still don't find a positive correlation between task affinity and transfer affinity in this setting. In the fourth setting, we have a different task set, though this task set also includes normals. We are using all 4 million instances and our high capacity network. Again, we see that the normals task helps with every task it is trained with. So what have we learned? First off, many common assumptions about multitask learning do not seem to be true. More similar tasks don't necessarily work better together. In fact, there seems to be no a priori way to tell which tasks will work well together and which tasks won't. Multitask learning doesn't necessarily work better when you have less data. Task relationships change significantly in different settings. They are sensitive to data set size and network capacity at least. Finally, the normals task seems to be a great one to train with if you want to improve performance on another task. In 15 out of 16 of the models that were trained with normals, the other task sees a benefit. Furthermore, this benefit was higher than the benefit of training with any other task 13 out of 15 times. This may be because norm normals have uniform values across surfaces and perform 3D edges. However, the normals task itself has poor performance when tends to have poor performance when paired with another task. We see that which tasks are learned together is critical for achieving good performance. So now we study how to find the best tasks to learn together. Uh, so in part two, we switch gears and we're gonna talk about how to exploit this knowledge to make fast and accurate predictions. When estimates for multiple tasks must be made for a single input image, there are multiple ways to compute those estimates. Of course, you can train a separate model for each task, or you can train one large multi-head model but there are hybrid approaches, and they each have their unique performance characteristics. Which of these are the best? This is a combinatorial problem. So for a given number of tasks and a given network budget, it becomes a problem of bipartite assignment. Every task must be assigned to a network. In other words, 
we must pick a subset of these edges subject to the constraint that every task must be connected to some network. For this example, we have a budget of three networks. This choice of edges means that task one and task two are grouped together and solved by network one. Task two is grouped alone and solved by network two, and tasks four and five are grouped together and solved by network three. Remember how training with normals was good for the other task but bad for normals? We find that it is often advantageous to allow for a network to include a task that is better solved by another network because the additional task improves the performance of the network on its other tasks. Decoders for these auxiliary tasks are discarded at test time. We propose a combinatorial, uh, computational framework for assigning tasks to networks that achieves the best total performance overall tasks solved while keeping inference time to a given budget. First, we create a set of candidate networks. Uh, we're going to choose our networks that we keep from those candidate set. The candidate set can include networks of any varying size and with any combinations. For our experiments, we train 31, we train a, a network for all 31 subsets of our five tasks. We also include five half size networks, one for each task. After training these networks, the idea becomes to pick the subset of networks that together perform the best on the given tasks and fit within the budget. Picking the optimal subset is NP-hard, unfortunately, but many algorithms exist that can quickly find the optimal solution anyway. We provide one that is based on branch and bound, but the problem could be reduced to your favorite NP-hard problem and solved with an off-the-shelf solver. Every optimal algorithm will find the same solution for each budget, so the algorithm isn't really that important. Here are the chosen networks for each budget. In this example, three full-size networks were chosen. One solves semantic segmentation, depth estimation, and normal prediction, though the decoder for normal prediction is thrown away at test time. The next solves normal prediction alone. The final network solves normal prediction, surf key points, and canny edges. Again, the decoder for normal prediction is thrown away. Notice how normals is a popular auxiliary task for all budgets. But this strategy is expensive. It requires that we train a large candidate set of networks, even though we only ultimately use a few. In many situations, it might be worth it to train an exponential number of candidate networks to ensure that you have the optimal grouping. You may even want to throw in networks trained with different architectures, task weights, or training strategies. But sometimes this is prohibitive. To allevi alleviate this burden, you can train each of the networks just a little bit. And based on their performance after just a little bit, choose which, which of the networks to train to, to convergence. We show that this works well, even when we only do a single pass through only 20% of the data. And that speeds the training phase up by 20 times. We can see that the networks chosen for various budgets are different for the approximation, but their performance is similar. Here's how well an all-in-one network scales at variance inference time budgets. At higher budgets, individual training wins out. Our optimal network cho choice performs the best. We find that the task weighting strategy of Senior et al performs poorly in this setting. Here is a baseline computed from the average of a thousand random groupings subject to our constraints. This shows that arbitrary task groupings can help, but picking the right groupings is key to the best performance. Finally, our approximation that speeds up training 20x outperforms all other strategies besides the optimal solution. Here are some qualitative results. We see noisy predictions from an all-in-one model using unit task weights. The predictions from the independent network strategy are better, but not as good as our optimal strategies. We can see that the predictions from the re-weighting method of Sienner et al. are much noisier. But the predictions from our approximation approach the optimal strategy's performance. Thanks for listening.